In June of last year, a trailer for a new horror film titled Smile started making its debut online and as a preview in select theaters. The trailer follows a woman named Rose as she's stalked by various people donning sinister smiles. I, along with the majority of people who first watched the trailer, had a similar thought, which was, wait a minute, I thought this movie came out already. I mean, I swear I've seen this before, right? No, no, I I've definitely seen this before. Well, as it turns out, no, we didn't. When a lot of people first saw the trailer for Smile, they confused it for 2018's Truth or Dare. Truth or Dare, which was a Blumhouse production film, had a trailer pretty similar to Smile's. Truth or Dare also featured individuals donning sinister smiles. Now, Truth or Dare wasn't exactly loved by critics, or fans, or anyone really for that matter, so when the trailer for Smile first came out, I thought it was going to be terrible. I think a lot of people who also watched the trailer for the first time felt the same way. I just thought it was gonna suck. Smile was made by Paramount Studios, and they had, let's just say, some interesting ideas for the marketing of this movie. So hey, there's a new horror movie coming out next week. It's called Smile, and you may have seen the commercials. Looks kind of creepy, and you may have also seen this if you were watching <laughs> baseball games over the weekend. Paramount apparently paid for actors to sit behind Along with the trailer, Paramount also sent actors to multiple MLB games the weekend before the film's release. The marketing team bought tickets behind home plate and had actors smiling menacingly at the camera while wearing smile t-shirts. One of these quote-unquote smilers was also seen on the Today Show behind Al Roker's shoulder. Paramount would actually end up spending an estimated $50 million on the marketing for Smile, which is kind of funny considering that it only cost Paramount $17 million to make. Now, as I said earlier, I thought this movie was going to suck, but after I saw how much Paramount had put into all the marketing of Smile, I said to myself, wow, this movie's really going to suck. I don't know why, but whenever I see a studio go overboard trying to advertise their own movie, it just makes me think that the movie's going to be really bad. To be fair, this marketing stunt did get people talking. Uh, the Smiler's appearance at the MLB games garnered over 18 million views on TikTok alone. But I have to imagine that most people shared my opinion and thought Smile was going to be a dumpster fire. So, was Smile really that bad? Well, Smile officially released in the United States on September 30th of last year. And it was great. It was better than great. It was one of the best horror movies to come out in the last few years. And that is saying a lot. The last few years has seen an incredible resurgence when it comes to horror. The mid-2000s to the early 2010s saw a lot of contrived, boring, and lazy films that relied way too heavily on jump scares and shitty CGI. But starting from 2012 onwards, the horror film industry has done a complete 180. We have studios like A24 and directors like Ari Aster and Jordan Peele to thank for this amazing new era of horror. To me, horror is one of the only genres left that has a shred of originality left. The last two to three years in particular have seen some films that have really pushed the envelope. 2022 especially saw a lot of great horrors. And I do mean a lot. X, Pearl, Prey, The Black Phone, Scream, and The Sadness are only but a handful of the amazing horror flicks that came out last year. 2022 was a great year for horror. And by the way, in case you're wondering why I didn't put Barbarian on that list, I just did not like that movie at all, but that's a whole other topic for a different day. And even with all the great horror flicks that came out last year, Smile was still one of the best. In fact, it was my second favorite horror movie from last year, only taking second place to Pearl. And I clearly wasn't the only person who thought Smile was great. Fans of Smile praised its atmosphere, its pacing, its cinematography, and story. Smile grossed a total of $105 million in North America, and another $111 million everywhere else. It made $20 million its opening weekend, so Paramount made a $3 million profit in only a couple days. It was number one at the box office for over three weeks until it was dethroned by Halloween Ends, which, in retrospect, that's just tragic. By November, it was the third R-rated movie to gross over $100 million during the pandemic, and it was the highest grossing horror movie worldwide during the pandemic as well. I'm pretty sure Paramount was as shocked as most of us were with how well Smile really did. Now, that's not to say that Smile was universally loved. While moviegoers definitely loved the film, critics had kind of mixed opinions about it. Most movie review sites seemed to either agree that Smile was great, 
or they say it's unoriginal and lazy with its scares. Now, this is where I'm going to kind of contradict myself here. I was just saying how I think horror is the only genre left with any originality left. And I stand by that completely, but Smile itself isn't exactly original. At its core, Smile follows Dr. Rose Cotter as she is cursed by an evil entity that can take the form of anyone it wants. A lot of critics compared Smile to other quote-unquote curse films, such as It Follows, The Ring, The Grudge, Oculus, and to a certain extent, Final Destination. I personally wouldn't say this is true. Smile is more of a character study of how one deals with trauma and guilt more than it's a curse movie. If you're going to compare Smile to any movie, it's much closer to The Babadook than it is to any of the movies I mentioned earlier. It may have similar aspects to films like It Follows and The Ring, but I believe Smile takes that idea and does something truly special with it. Even if fans and critics couldn't agree on a lot of things about Smile, there was one aspect that was universally praised, and that was Sosie Bacon's performance. As I said earlier, Smile is a character study. Sosie Bacon plays Smile's lead character, Dr. Rose Cotter. Smile writer and director Parker Finn saw Bacon in The Mayor of Easttown and knew she was perfect for the role of Rose. Sosie Bacon is in every single scene of this film. Seriously, try to find one scene of Smile she's not in. You can't. She's on the screen from beginning to end. This is a risky choice. If viewers don't sympathize with Rose, then her constant appearance in the film is going to be really grating. You're not going to care what happens to her. But Bacon's performance is so believable, there isn't a single scene where you don't sympathize with what she's going through. Horror is a genre that rarely gets the respect it deserves. There are so many great examples of incredible performances in horror films that get overlooked because the industry as a whole sees horror as a niche. It's really unfortunate. And Sosie Bacon stands up there with some of the best performances in horror. I think this scene really illustrates my point. Here, Rose is trying to tell her boyfriend Trevor about the entity that's chasing her. At this point in the film, Rose has already shown pretty clear signs of mental decline. Of course, Trevor doesn't believe her and accuses her of inheriting her mother's mental illness. Fed up with no one believing her, Rose snaps at Trevor. Once she calms down, you can see the regret and sadness in her face. She looks down in defeat, knowing her outburst didn't help her case at all for not being crazy. She doubles down and apologizes to Trevor even though he's the one who's not supporting his spouse. It's a very real response that makes sense in the context of the film. One of Smile's best aspects is the slow decline of Rose's mental stability. At first, Rose doesn't believe what she's seeing is real. She's a doctor after all. She's trained to conquer problems with logic and reason rather than emotion. But as more bizarre events happen to her, Rose is left with no other conclusion than to face the impending horror that's plaguing her. This was a big challenge for Sosie Bacon during the filming of Smile. Like most movies, Smile was filmed out of order, so she had to constantly switch her emotions back and forth depending on what Rose's mental state was meant to be in that particular scene. I should also mention that Smile was Sosie Bacon's first time in a lead role, and for her first time in the lead, she absolutely killed it. By the way, did not realize this when I was writing the script, but Sosie Bacon is actually the daughter of actor Kevin Bacon. I, um, I don't really have much to say about that. I just figured that out now and felt like I should probably put that in somewhere. Of course, not all the credit can go to Sosie Bacon. I've already mentioned Smile writer and director Parker Finn in passing, but I'm going to go more in depth here. Smile was Finn's first time directing a feature-length film. All of Finn's previous directorial work was on short films. In fact, the inspiration for Smile came from one of Finn's short films, titled Laura Hasn't Slept. Like Smile, Parker Finn both wrote and directed Laura Hasn't Slept. Filmed in 2019, Laura Hasn't Slept made its debut a year later at the 2020 South by Southwest. Laura Hasn't Slept follows the titular character Laura, played by Caitlin Stacy, as she recounts her experience with reoccurring nightmares and hallucinations to her therapist. Laura Hasn't Slept was so well received at South by Southwest that Paramount asked Finn to turn his short into a feature-length film. This was Smile's conception. Parker was extremely thankful to Paramount for letting him make the movie, and ultimately making the choice to turn Smile into a theatrical release. Originally, Paramount was going to release Smile as a Paramount Plus exclusive, but after test audiences gave Smile much better scores than Paramount initially thought, they decided to put it in theaters, which was obviously a good choice. Paramount's distribution chief, Chris Aronson, would say, Smile exceeded our wildest expectations. Growing up, Parker Finn read a lot of Stephen King. He cites the author as one of his biggest creative inspirations. 
Parker came up with the initial idea for the story because he wanted to study the trauma we carry around and hide from the rest of the world. He was inspired by movies like Rosemary's Baby and Todd Haynes' Safe with Julia Moore for their themes of not being able to trust anyone around you. He liked the idea of having a character that no one believed no matter what they said. He was also heavily inspired by a Japanese film titled Cure, which had a lot of nightmarish atmospheres. Finn purposely constructed the film to break audiences' expectations. There are multiple times in the movie when the viewer is pulled in one direction, only for the movie to pull the rug under your feet and do something completely different. This was done so, just like Rose, the audience can't trust anything they see on the screen. The fun of questioning whether what Rose is seeing is real or is in her head is really well done. But it doesn't matter if these things are happening for real or not, because they are still happening to her. While yes, there are more stereotypical jump scares and smile, the real horror comes from Rose's mental decline. Finn emulated the feeling of paranoia perfectly. The fact that Smile was Finn's first time directing a full-length feature film is honestly kind of mind-boggling. In one film, he has made a name for himself in a genre with a lot of titans. That accomplishment cannot be praised enough. Smile began principal photography on October 11, 2021 and finished filming on November 24, 2021. Smile was primarily filmed in Hoboken, New Jersey. A few scenes were also filmed in Jersey City, Morristown, and North Arlington. Why does it seem like more movies are being filmed in New Jersey nowadays? Joker and The Equalizer were also filmed in New Jersey. And currently, Joker 2 is being filmed in Belleville. The hospital scene in the beginning of the film was shot at the Rutgers New Jersey Medical School in Newark. While filming, Smile went under their working title, Something's Wrong with Rose, which I have to say I think is a much better title than Smile. Smile is just such a generic and kind of boring name, Something's Wrong with Rose just fits the movie so much better. As I've mentioned before, Smile is a character study. The real horrors of Smile comes from Rose's slow mental decline. I think that the original title captures that theme perfectly, but I guess Smile just fits better on a poster. Post-production began and finished in May of 2022. Smile's visual effects were done by The Artery, a visual effects studio based in New York, and the practical effects were done by ADI. They were the guys behind both the alien and the predator designs. This is the point in the video when I would usually start talking about the movie, comic, or whatever I'm talking about. But before we do that, I thought it'd be a good idea if we look at the short film that inspired Smile first. What was it about Laura Hasn't Slept that made audiences go crazy and convinced Paramount to put all of their cards on our new time director? Well, let's take a look together. This is Laura Hasn't Slept. The short film opens with Laura waking up in her therapist's office. Laura's having the same recurring nightmares for a week. In Laura's nightmares, a man is always there smiling at her and calling her name over and over again. Laura says that it's the same man, but he wears a different face every time she sees him. This premise kind of reminds me of that old internet hoax, Have You Seen This Man? You guys remember that? Supposedly a bunch of like patients in mental hospitals were having the same dream of the same man, but it turned out to be completely fake. I think it was for like some movie that didn't come out but still a creepy idea. Her therapist, Dr. Parsons, played by Lou Temple, asks Laura if she recognizes the man. This is an interesting question because a lot of people say that your brain cannot actually create people while you're dreaming. It's believed that you always see someone you know, or at least someone you've seen before, but you just don't recognize them when you're asleep. This is actually kind of impossible to prove, being that 99% of the time you can't recall the faces you see in a dream. This is more of a theory than anything. It can be possible that we combine certain features of people we know into one face, but again, it's hard to prove. Laura said that the man's always smiling at her, but it's not a friendly smile. Recurring dreams do have a significant meaning to us. A recurring dream can often indicate an unresolved conflict we have in our lives. Recurring dreams, or nightmares, have been linked to stress, anxiety, fear, trauma, or a number of other factors. For example, if you're having dreams that you're being chased, this can mean you're being overwhelmed with too many tasks and responsibilities. If you keep having dreams that your teeth are falling out, this can indicate that you're often self-conscious about your appearance. In Laura's case, a recurring dream about being chased can mean that you're experiencing heightened or ongoing stress, or you're wishing to avoid something you'd rather not face, or you feel you're being overwhelmed with life. Recurring dreams where you feel like you're being chased have also been shown to be linked to PTSD and anxiety. Laura says that she's terrified of sleeping now. She feels like in her dreams, she can be hurt in real life. She's kept herself awake for two days straight. I love how bleak and dull the colors are in the office. Color and lighting are two of the most important elements in horror. Lighting sets the mood of the scene and color can indicate the emotions we feel. The therapist's office helps the viewer relate to Laura's situation. Caitlin Stacy's performance definitely helps as well. Laura says that the man in her dream wants to show her his real face behind all the fake faces. Laura thinks that if she sees the monster's real face, 
then she will die. Tell me, Lord, are you certain you're not dreaming right now? This is one of Laura's nightmares. The room starts to decay. The entity's eyes roll back and it grows a sinister smile on its face. Laura tries to run away. That is until she sees the doors are blocked by walls of brick. I love how the entity stands you can hear crackling bones. Its fingers start to twitch and it starts calling Laura's name. Laura turns around where she sees the entity is about to show her its true face. When the entity speaks, it sounds like multiple people are speaking at once. Laura tells herself that the monster isn't real. Things go quiet for a while. The camera pans around the office and the thing is nowhere to be found. That is until the creature appears again and Laura starts to rip her own face off. This is where the short ends. The song I Had a Dream by Al Hassan plays during the end credits. The end song in horror movies is actually really important. It's the last thing the viewer will remember and it lets you reflect on what you just saw. Most horror movies will have something suspenseful at the end to get your nerves up one last time. Some movies, like Paranormal Activity, have no music. This can make the viewer feel uneasy and make you feel uncomfortable. Laura Hasn't Slept chooses a song that offsets the disturbing imagery you just saw, making what you just witnessed even more bizarre. In just 11 short minutes, Laura Hasn't Slept hits all of the markers of a great horror film. It sets up the horror, makes you sympathize with the main character, pulls the rug right from under you, and brings the scares. Caitlin Stacy and Lou Temple play their roles perfectly. Caitlin makes it so easy to sympathize with her and to relate to her dread. And once the switch from reality to nightmare happens, Lou Temple goes from the concerned and thoughtful therapist to a malicious and hateful monster. Once we know this is one of Laura's nightmares, the transition of the office is so masterfully done. I love how the walls literally look like they're rotting away. Laura Hasn't Slept may be one of the best representations of a nightmare I've ever seen. This short serves as the perfect appetizer. And now that we've taken a look at Laura Hasn't Slept, we can finally move on to the main course. So, let's finally take a look at 2022's surprising horror masterpiece, Smile. Now before we get into it, I do have to mention that Smile does have a lot of violent scenes in it. Of course, I can't actually show a lot of these moments on YouTube, so I'm gonna have to blur out some things and just totally not show others, but I'll do my best to describe what's happening. My last video did get demonetized, so it would be nice if this video could at least get a little bit of money. Surprisingly, despite all the violence in the movie, they were never told to take anything out by the MPAA. Uh, if you don't know what the MPAA is, they're basically a corporation uh, that oversees all the major production studios in the US. One of their duties is to enforce specific guidelines for movies. The MPAA also established the rating system we use for movies, you know, G, PG, R, and, and all the rest. They'll tell studios to cut back on violence if they feel like it's too gratuitous or excessive. Luckily for Smile, the violent scenes are spaced out enough, so the MPAA just let it slide. Okay, now we can finally get to it. The film opens with a dead woman lying face down in a bed. This opening shot is almost exactly the same as another opening shot in another one of Parker Finn's short films called The Hide Behind, which funny enough is also about a smiling monster that stalks its victims. The camera pans and we see alcohol bottles and cigarettes on the floor. We see a family picture on the nightstand with two little girls and their presumed parents. We see one of the little girls from the picture standing by the doorway staring at her dead mother. We cut to Dr. Rose Cotter's waking up in her office. We can assume she was the little girl standing at the door. Dr. Cotters works as a therapist in an emergency psychiatric unit. She's called in to help a manic patient named Carl. Apparently, Carl has been to this ward a few times before. He keeps mumbling that he's going to die. He's going to die over and over again. Meanwhile, outside, we see a patient strapped down to a gurney being brought to the hospital. After her meeting with Carl, Dr. Cotters meets with her superior, Dr. Morgan Desi, played by Cal Penn. I guess Kumar stuck with medical school after all. Dr. Desi scolds Rose over her decision to send a patient with no insurance to a high-end facility. Rose is fed up with the bureaucracy of the hospital. Her only interest is to help her patients. Rose is a workaholic. It's not irregular for her to work over 80 hours a week. We see Rose pack up and leave for the day. The camera slowly pans across her quiet office. It's common to smile for the camera to stay on a shot for just a second too long. It's a simple but effective way to make the viewer feel uncomfortable. We're trained to expect a big pop when we hear a long silence. This awkward silence is finally broken when Rose's office phone rings. She's called in to help with a manic grad student who witnessed her professor take his own life. Hey, doesn't that grad student look kind of familiar? Yeah, that's Caitlin Stacy as Laura. And no, this is not an Easter egg or a cameo. That's actually Laura from Laura Hasn't Slept. 
Smile isn't an adaptation of Laura Hasn't Slept, it's a sequel. I think this works on two levels. First, if you saw Laura Hasn't Slept, then you already know what's happening and what horror Rose is about to face. If you didn't watch Laura Hasn't Slept, then this just adds to the mystery of the film. I really like the fact that Parker Finn made Smile a continuation of Laura Hasn't Slept. Instead of taking the short film and somehow extending it to two hours, he expanded the story he already established. Though, it's a bit strange that Smile is a sequel, considering the fact that Paramount tried to scrub Laura Hasn't Slept from the internet like a week before Smile came out. That's like if Sylvester Stallone was to destroy every copy and reel of Rocky 1 before Rocky 2 came out. Doesn't really make much sense. But in this case, they actually took Laura Hasn't Slept off the internet so they could make it a bonus feature for the Blu-ray. The two sit down and Laura tries to tell Rose what's happening to her. She says someone, or something, is chasing her. The entity seems to chase people who have trauma from seeing someone die in front of them. Laura says that the entity just smiles at her every time she looks at it. It wears different people's faces. It told Laura that today is the day she's going to die. Laura pleads with Rose to believe her, but she's just trying to diagnose her. Laura starts to freak out and falls out of her chair. She says that she sees the thing from her dreams in the room. Rose looks around but sees nothing. Laura crawls up to the wall, and Rose calls for help. Something seems to take over Laura. She grabs a broken piece of glass and cuts her throat while smiling the whole time. I really love the fact that Laura is the one who spreads the curse to Rose. She's the one who kicks off the events of the movie. This is where we finally get our title card over 13 minutes into the movie. Finn made the choice to have a long wait for the title card because he wanted to wait for a really big moment to bring the title in. The police come and ask Rose about Laura's death. She's visibly shaken. Rose goes back home when she notices a drop of blood from Laura on her shirt, so she hops in the shower. While drinking wine in her kitchen, we see Laura smiling at her in the corner. This reminds me a lot of that one scene in Hereditary. Rose's boyfriend, Trevor, comes in and surprises her, making Rose drop her wine. Trevor is played by Jesse T. Usher. Good to see he's finally over Popclaw and got rid of that nasty V addiction. The two go out to dinner with Rose's sister, Holly, played by Jillian Zinzer, and her husband, Greg, played by Nick Arabiglou. We can still see that Rose is visibly distraught as she zones out during dinner. Holly snaps Rose out of it, and the two start to argue about Rose not selling their old house. Rose and Holly are shown to have a strained relationship early on. Rose goes back to work, where she asks a nurse to give her a copy of Laura's former police report. Joel, one of the detectives from earlier, played by Kyle Galliner, comes back to check on Rose. It seems the two have some kind of history together. The police report is Laura's witness statement regarding her professor who killed himself in front of her. Laura's professor killed himself with a claw hammer while smiling at Laura. It seems this is how the entity got to Laura. Holly calls Rose and reminds her to bring a gift for her son's birthday. While looking out the window, Rose sees what looks like Laura standing on the ground below. The idea for the pink walls of a hospital came from an old article Parker Finn read saying that violent prisoners were less violent if the prison walls were pink. Rose walks past Carl's room and goes to check on him. While You're smiling crazily at Rose, You're Carl starts telling die. Dr. Cotters You're that she's going to die soon. Rose has the guards restrain him, and she meets once again with Dr. Desi. He's worried for Rose's mental health and gives her a paid week off. When she gets out of work, she goes to a store to buy Holly's son a gift. Back home, Rose starts wrapping the gift. She gets a text from Trevor saying he won't be home until late. While in the kitchen, the emergency alarm suddenly goes off, making her drop another glass of wine. Rose grabs a knife and goes to turn off the alarm. She sees that the back door has been open. She gets a call from the emergency service to see what's going on. Or, at least that's what we're led to believe. Yeah, uh, the, the back door of my house is open. Are you alone in the house, ma'am? Yes. Are you sure? What? Are you sure you haven't let something inside, Rose? She gets the call again, except for real this time, and the police show up. The cops tell her it was probably just a false alarm. With everything settled down, Rose goes back inside, starts looking for her cat mustache, but can't seem to find him anywhere. She walks outside, still trying to find the cat, and starts staring off into the woods. She starts thinking of her mother again. This is yet another nightmare, and Rose wakes up in bed next to Trevor. Unable to go back to sleep, Rose gets up and starts listening to her session with Laura. While listening back to the tape, she hears a mysterious voice calling her name. She starts playing the audio again and again as a woman appears next to Rose. And I will admit, this is one of the cheaper jump scares in the movie. But most of the other scares are way better. I'll explain this in a jump scare much later. Trevor wakes up and tries to calm her down. Next, we see Rose visit her old personal therapist, Dr. Madeline Northcott, played by Robin Weigert. Here's where we learn that Rose's mother took her own life. 
Rose has dealt with feelings of guilt over her mother's suicide for years. Rose asks Dr. Northcott for a prescription of Risperdal. Risperdone, or Risperdal, which is a brand name, is an atypical antipsychotic, so it's used primarily to treat schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and irritability if it's associated with some form of autism. At this point, she believes the odd thing she's seeing is coming from post-trauma after witnessing Laura's death. Right now, Rose believes her visions are just that, visions. Dr. Northcott tells her before she tries medicine, she may just want to relax and take some time to herself. She tells her to see her again. It seems Rose and Dr. Northcott used to have visits regularly. Next, we see Rose visiting her nephew's birthday party. She starts zoning out again while they sing. Later, when Jackson, Holly's son, starts opening his presents, he starts to open Rose's. Inside the box is Rose's dead cat, Mustache. Rose killed Mustache and put him in the box, but she has no memory of doing it. While she starts to break down, Rose sees the entity at the party. Let's actually talk about the smiling for a little bit. The smiling works so well here. Unlike Truth or Dare, the smiling here doesn't come off as goofy or comical. When constructing the smile of the victims, Parker Finn wanted a look that appears to be frozen in time. It was important to get that sweet spot. There should be nothing human about it, but it shouldn't look comical. Finn himself would test this by trying out different smiles in the mirror. The reason why the monster smiles is to be somewhat of a contradiction. We often smile to hide what we're really feeling. The entity uses the smile almost as a way to let you know that danger is coming. Rose freaks out and falls into the glass table. She cuts her arms and is brought to the ER, where Dr. Desi comes to check on her again. The whole time, she's distracted by a smiling face in the doctor's office. Trevor drives Rose home. She tries to tell him what's happening to her, but he doesn't believe her. Trevor suspects Rose may have inherited mental issues from her mother. Smile makes it so easy to emphasize with Rose. You just want someone to believe her. Trevor sleeps on the couch while Rose reads through Laura's police report again. She looks up Laura's old professor, Gabriel Munoz, to see if there's anything else she can find out. She's trying to connect all the dots. Rose hears a voice calling out to her. The voice is mimicking her mother's. The next day, Rose goes to see Mrs. Munoz, played by Judy Reyes, the wife of Laura's old professor. Rose learns that Professor Munoz was suffering from the same visions as she was. We see Professor Munoz had a room full of the drawings of things he saw. We see a lot of smiling faces and people ripping their faces off. We learn that Professor Munoz also witnessed someone kill themselves. This is how the entity got to him. Rose tries to tell Mrs. Munoz what's happening to her, but Mrs. Munoz gets upset and demands that she leaves. Rose goes to Joel for help. She asks him to look into Professor Munoz for her. Joel reluctantly agrees, and we find the identity of the woman who Professor Munoz saw kill themselves. The woman's name was Angela Powell. She cut her own eyes out in front of Munoz, and yes, she did it while smiling. Angela also witnessed someone kill themselves. We see a video of Angela and an unknown man outside of a gas station. We see the man grab a pair of hedge clippers. I think the rest is self-explanatory. Rose prints out the police files and she heads back home. When Rose gets back home, she sees Trevor and Dr. Northcott waiting for her. They're having a sort of intervention for Rose. Rose gets upset and her and Trevor get into a fight. Rose walks out and goes back to her sister Holly's house. Rose tries to tell Holly about the curse, but of course she doesn't believe her. We learn that Holly actually left Rose with their mother when they were both very young. She partly apologizes and tells Rose that she thinks she's having a breakdown. She gets frustrated and goes back to her car. Holly. This is the great scare I was talking about earlier. You probably just expect her to pop her head down with a smile on her face, but to see her neck contort in such a bizarre way, and for it to happen so suddenly, it really catches you off guard. Most horror flicks would switch perspectives so the jump scare is happening right in front of your face, but in Smile, all the scares are happening to rows. It doesn't feel as cheap. This is probably the best scare in the movie. Too bad they showed it in the fucking trailer. Seriously, why? Why would you do that? Horror movie trailers well, actually, no. Movie trailers in general nowadays always show way too much. Remember when the trailer for Terminator Genesis came out? The trailer showed, like, a major plot twist in the movie. And one of the movie's producers, at least I think it was a producer, went on Twitter and told people not to watch the trailer. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Anyway, Rose freaks out and drives away. We can see Holly's son, Jackson, watch Rose from the window. 
Next, we see Rose outside of a diner eating in her car. Joel calls her and tells her that he followed the pattern back to 20 people and 19 suicides. The 20th person, a man named Robert Talley, is still alive and in prison for killing a woman he didn't know. He killed the woman in front of a man who ended up killing himself a week later, and then the pattern continued. Rose decides she needs to meet this Robert Talley. Joel picks her up and she tells him about the curse. Joel, of course, has trouble believing her, but he's willing to help anyway. Rose has a feeling that if she meets with Robert, she might learn how to beat this thing. Joel tells Rose that none of the victims survived longer than a week after seeing the entity. Rose is currently on day four, so her time's running out. Rose and Joel get to the prison, and Rose is able to get an interview with Robert by pretending to be a reporter. She tells Robert, played by Rob Morgan, about Laura. You can see him start to get tense. He says he'll only talk to her if Joel leaves. He does, and Robert tells her, that once the entity stalked him too. He started doing research. He found the man in Brazil who escaped the entity by killing his neighbor and passing it on to the neighbor's wife. The only way to get rid of the entity is to kill someone in front of a witness, and it has to be particularly brutal. The entity likes to toy with its victims. It spreads through trauma. It feeds off it. Robert finds out that Rose has the entity and starts to freak out. When asked what happened, Rose lies to Joel and tells them that they need to leave. Let's talk about Smile's score for a minute. The film's score was composed by Cristobal Tapia. Smile loves to build tension at the end of the scene. This is either done by the score or just the bass. When things calm down, the score comes up and gets your heart racing again. It's effective. It never gives the viewer a real chance to feel like they're safe. Next, we see Rose looking over all the police files again. She cuts her finger and goes to the sink to clean it up. She hears the doorbell ring and she grabs a knife. She opens the door to see Dr. Northcott. She reluctantly lets her in and they start to talk. You can see Rose's mental state reflect with her physical state. She has red eyes and bags from lack of sleep. Rose gets a phone call and when she answers, she hears Dr. Northcott on the other end. The Dr. Northcott in front of her is the entity. I think Robin Weigert has to have the creepiest smile out of all of them. Though, Caitlin Stacy's is pretty creepy as well. A cool detail is that all of the cursed smilers wear bright pastel colors while Rose wears dark grays and blacks. The contrast is to show the difference between Rose's misery and the entity's joy of toying with its victim. The entity starts making its way towards Rose, backing her up against a wall and grabbing her face. Next, we see Rose in her car outside the hospital with a knife in their passenger seat. She's going to give the curse to someone else. She walks into Carl's room. You can see he looks terrified of her. He backs into the corner and starts to scream. Dr. Desi walks in to see what's happening. She starts stabbing Carl, but nothing happens. He just laughs. Desi starts to scream and rips his own face off. This was all just a nightmare. The real Dr. Desi meets her outside. He tries to get her to come in, but she drives away. Setup wise, this scene is very similar to Laura Hasn't Slept. The transition from reality to nightmare is so well done. This scene becomes scarier when you consider the fact that it's the entity that's making Rose see all of this. It's like it's telling her that even if you try to pass this curse onto someone else, it's not going to work. You really have a feeling like she's stuck with this curse no matter what she does. Joel calls Rose and tells her that he saw an APB about her. Rose is going to hide in her old house so she can't spread the entity to anyone. Joel tries calling her again, but she leaves her phone in the car. Rose walks around the house and starts recounting old memories. There's one room she's hesitant to walk into. We can hear wailing coming from inside. We get a flashback of a young Rose with her mother, played by Dora Ross. She took too many pills and she's going to die soon. She tells Rose to call for help, but Rose runs away and lets her mother die. Her mom didn't kill herself, not intentionally at least. She would have lived if Rose had gotten help. This is the guilt she's been carrying all these years. She closes all the blinds and blocks out all the doors. She lights up a lamp and sits by herself. We hear a door open. Rose starts to walk around the house and she hears her mother crying. She walks to the old bedroom and sees her mom sitting on the edge of her bed. Her mother gets up and says she's so sorry for being a bad mom. Rose says that she's afraid of her mother and that's why she didn't ask for help. She's carried that guilt with her all her life, but now she has to let it go. The mother grows a sinister smile and starts to go after her. She grows into this giant monstrosity. The entity throws her across the room. Rose drops the lamp and a fire starts. She tries to fight back, but it's just too strong. 
she's able to break the monster's hand and sets it on fire. Rose runs out as her old family home starts to burn down. She drives away and goes to Joel's. She apologizes for bringing him into her mess. She asks if she can stay at his place. Joel says yes. The lights go out and Joel rolls a smile. I love how this scene is almost a direct callback to Laura hasn't slept. This is still a nightmare. It's a fake out. She wakes up outside of her old house. It never burned down and she never went to Joel. The real Joel comes to check on her. She runs back inside and the entity comes out. Joel can hear Rose screaming and he starts kicking his way in. Remember when I told you Smile likes pulling the rug right from under you? This is one of them. I feel like the scene is a great example as well when I was talking about how the film, the way it's, it's paced and the construction of the scenes is made in a way to where you don't know if what you're seeing is real or not. So you can't trust what you're looking at just like Rose can't trust what she's looking at either. It really puts you in her shoes and it's, it's well done. The entity reveals its real face. It opens Rose's mouth and starts to crawl in. Believe it or not, this thing is 100% practical. Parker had the design for the monster early on. Then he went to ADI, and with the help of Alec Gillis and Tom Woodruff Jr., Finn was able to make his vision to reality. This huge monster ended up being a whopping 9 feet tall. The entity, the monster, whatever you want to call it, actually didn't have an official name, but it had a bunch of nicknames throughout shooting. What I love about the scene is how it makes another scene earlier in the film way scarier. Laura's freakout was horrifying when you first saw it, but now that you know this is what she was looking at, this scene becomes a thousand times more haunting. I'm a huge fan of the design of this monster as well. If you really look at the entity, it looks like a bunch of bodies that have been stuffed one on top of the other. And now that we know how the entity enters the body, that's not that far-fetched. Joel finally kicks his way in, but he's too late. Rose has covered herself in kerosene. She turns around with that smile on her face and she sets herself on fire in front of Joel. The cycle continues. This is where the film ends. The song Lollipop by the Cordettes plays during the credits, referring to the way the monster enters your body. The ending of this movie is the whole reason why I wanted to make this video. A lot of modern horror films typically have a happy ending. Parker Finn always planned for Smile to have a bleak and ambiguous ending. Rose's character gets the emotional resolve but the monster still got her at the end. Earlier, I said Smile was a lot more comparable to the Babadook than it is to the Ring or the Grudge. And after thoroughly looking through Smile, I see that the two movies are even more alike than I first thought. The Babadook is also a psychological horror with a monster that's the manifestation of trauma and guilt. The difference between the two films is how the victims handle their trauma. Rose tried to destroy hers. She thought it worked, but it just ended up coming back again. Amelia from the Babadook conquered her guilt mastering it until it was like a pet. She locked it in her basement and fed it like a dog. I think this is comparable to real life as well. You won't always be able to destroy your trauma or your guilt, but if you try to ignore it, it'll just come back stronger. But if you can master it, if you don't let it eat you or let it destroy you, then you can live with your guilt and learn to grow from it. I do think there is a way to beat the entity, without killing someone that is, but it's not the way Rose did it. If you take anything away from Smile, it's to take care of your mental health before it's too late. But more importantly, do it in a smart and safe way. It's an important message that often gets overlooked. Now, don't get me wrong, Smile isn't going to revolutionize the horror genre. It's not the next Exorcist or Hereditary, but it is a great film with a great story and an important message. I do think we're eventually going to see more from the world of Smile. In fact, Parker Finn basically confirmed it. When asked about the possibility of another film, Finn said that he purposely left certain aspects of Smile ambiguous so he can explore them more in a sequel. I want to learn more about the monster's mythos. Where does it come from? How does it work? Is there another way to beat it? I think there's a lot more here to discover, and I personally cannot wait. Well, I think I made it pretty clear that I really love this movie. But tell me what did you guys think? Did you like it? Hate it? Do you think there's more going on here, or is it just a bunch of cheap jump scares and loud pops? What other new horror movies did you guys like? Are there any more you guys want to see me cover? Let me know down in the comments below, and as always, thank you for watching. I'm starting to sound like a broken record here, I think, but I'm still just so amazed at the amount of people that have watched my channel and have left such amazing comments. It still blows my mind. Uh, seriously, thank you. If you want to find me uh, in other places, I am on Twitter. 
I am on Twitch. Uh, I recently started streaming. I don't have a schedule as of yet, but I will update when I do. Um, I'll post all that on the screen now. And yeah, just once again, thank you. And that's all I got to say. Thanks for watching and have a great rest of your day.